uh, Rob Scott. Uh, Rob Scott helps oversee the international outreach at St. Helens Bishopsgate, which involves supporting the church's mission partners overseas, as well as outreach cross-culturally in London. And for the latter, he has often shared a platform with Muslim speakers to discuss similarities and differences between Christianity and Islam. And these meetings for better understanding have taken place in churches, mosques, community centers, and universities. His book, Dear Abdullah, Eight Questions Muslim People Ask About Christianity, came out of these talks. And he also lectures in Islamic studies at Oak Hill Theological College in North London. 10 years ago, Robert and his family spent 18 months in Bangladesh learning the Sileti language in order to better understand the many people of Sileti background in Tower Hamlets. And now back in Tower Hamlets, he and his family are partnering with other local churches to share the gospel with Sileti people. Previously, he worked for the World Health Organization and the Charity Commission. Adnan Rashid is a historian with a specialty in the history of Islamic civilization, comparative religion, and hadith literature. He has represented Islam and Muslims on a number of media platforms, including the BBC. He is also the head of the Hittin Institute, as well as a senior researcher and lecturer. He is presently serving as a khatib in a number of London mosques. Currently, he is also conducting an extensive tafsir course explaining the meaning of the Quran to wider, wider audiences based on the work of Ibn Kathir. So what we're going to do is we'll have each of these speakers speak for 10 minutes. Uh, then they both get to reply to the, the respective other speaker for five minutes each. And after that, we'll open up for Q&A. Um, this is one of the ways for you to uh, submit a question. The other is just to raise your arm and we have a microphone here and you could just ask your question in person. Since we're back to in-person events, that is also a nice way of engaging with each other. It's obviously the most important topic. If there is a God, how do we get to know him? How do we live in his world? Now, this guy, Miroslav Volf, he's a Croatian a theologian based at Yale University in, in the States. This microphone's just gone. Um, said, Christian and Muslims worship one and the same God. I reject the idea that Muslims worship a different God than do Jews and Christians. I won't ask for a show of hands as to whether you agree or you don't agree, but does it matter whether we do believe in the same God or not? Uh, Miroslav Volf, um, as his name suggests, is a Croatian. He grew up in former Yugoslavia and saw the mess the horrible mess between Croats and Serbs, and more importantly, the genocide of Bosnian Muslims and in Kosovo. And so recognises that religion can cause real, real damage. And so he wants to bring unity, which is why he wrote this book, suggesting that we believe the same things. But do we believe the same things? The Bible and the Quran clearly share words and concepts. They talk about God. They talk about heaven and hell. They talk about sin, they talk about prophets. But do they share meanings? We might use the same words, but do we have the same meanings? And that's what we're going to explore uh, this afternoon in the little time that we do have. But this is supposed to start a conversation between members of the Christian Union, members of ISOC, members of the university. If we can't have these kind of conversations, how can we live in the same community together? Uh, recently, with some uh, friends in Tower Hamlets, like they football with, uh, some Muslim friends, uh, we were having various discussions, um, political, economic, all kinds of things, and we thought, let's try and compare and contrast our stories, the prophets. We've been doing that on Zoom and in person. And it's been really interesting working through what uh, the Bible says, what the Quran, and Islamic and Christian traditions say about these different prophets, Adam and Eve, uh, Noah, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Joseph, and so on. I'm just gonna begin that we thought there'd be lots of similarities, and there are, but actually it brought out one big difference, which is about the beginning of this talk, really. When looking at one of the stories about Abraham, when he was told that he would have a son, uh, even though uh, he and his wife were childless and they were very old, we were told the Lord, as in God, appeared to Abraham to promise him a son, Isaac. That same story, narrated in the Quran, says this, and surely our messenger angels came to Abraham with good news. Of a son. Same news, same son, but who brought the news? Was it God Himself, the Lord, present with Abraham, 
Or was it his messenger angels? Throughout the Bible, God, the Lord, at Yahweh, that seems to appear to people. The word Lord in capitals uh, in the Bible uh, is the kind of proper name, or the translation of the proper name Yahweh in the Hebrew. Uh, Jewish people were very hesitant to say the name Yahweh. And so when it got translated into Greek by Jewish people in the second century uh, BC, they put the word kind of Lord in Greek in capitals. And the English translation has taken that on. But just Yahweh, the personal name of God. And Yahweh, right at the beginning of the Bible, in the Torah, has a spirit who hovers over the chaotic pre-creation waters and a powerful word which creates all things, including people, in his own image, we're told. Uh, Yahweh, we're told, personally interacts with Adam and Eve. He tells them not to eat from the fruits of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or they will surely die. He speaks to them. And then when they do eat that tree, he then walks in the garden to find them where they are hiding in their fear and shame and guilt. He speaks and he walks. Uh, Yahweh also sees and grieves, which is in the middle of the handout. He sees and grieves over the world's wickedness in the time of Noah. And he talks with Noah and he blesses Noah. There's a personal there's a relationship going on there. And that kind of personalness, that appearance, that relationalness carries on with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, uh, with my footballing friends. We were looking at the story of Jacob last week, actually. And it's interesting, again, similar stories. Similar stories about a dream up to heaven that Jacob had, an angel descending and ascending. But then there's a, a story about Jacob mysteriously wrestling with a man at night. And the Islamic tradition says that's an angel again. But the Bible says that's God. So God again appears to people. And then Yahweh appears in the burning bush to the prophet Moses and declares his name. He reveals his name, the great I Am, which becomes the name Yahweh in Hebrew. He comes down to a mountain, Mount Sinai, to speak uh, with Israel. They're so scared. They don't want to hear his voice. I want Moses to intercede for them. And then he passes before Moses on Mount Sinai, proclaiming his name and his character. He says, the Lord, the Lord, the gracious, the compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, but not holding the, the guilty unpunished. And in that phrase there, we see two sides to Yahweh, God. We see a holiness, a purity, a light, that he can't be approached except on his own terms, that sinners can't get close to him. And we see he is merciful, he is kind, he is compassionate. And those two themes track throughout the, the Hebrew and the Greek scriptures. And in some ways they're summarised in one part of the New Testament, where we're told that God is light, in him is no darkness at all. And shortly after that we're told that God is love. And those two things track throughout uh, the Bible there, from the beginning through the middle to the end. And when we come to the end of the Bible we see this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared and the sea vanished. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready, like a bride dressed to meet her husband. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with people. He will live with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There'll be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. The God who walked in the garden with Adam and Eve now dwells in the city with his people forever. So we see throughout these scriptures that Yahweh is relational, he's personal, he's involved, he's present. He's also described as a father, a husband, a helper, relational words with deep meaning. Is that the same kind of God that you know within your own tradition, whatever that is? And we also see particularly, he's not just uniquely relational and personal, but he's a unique revealer and rescuer. This is one thing that's said through the prophet Moses. Yahweh says, search the past, the time before you were born, all the way back to the time when God created human beings on earth. Has anything as great as this ever happened before? Has anyone ever heard of anything like this? Have any people ever lived after hearing a God speak to them from a fire, as you have up Mount Sinai? Has any God ever dared to go and take a people from another nation and make it his own? 
as Yahweh, your God, did for you in Egypt, before your very eyes. He used his great power and strength. He brought plagues and war, worked miracles and wonders, and caused terrifying things to happen. But Yahweh has shown you this to prove to you that he alone is God, and there is no other. He let you hear his voice from heaven so he could instruct you. And here on earth he let you see his holy fire, and he spoke to you from it. This says that only Yahweh has spoken. Through the Bible, he speaks today, he's revealing himself to us. And it says, only Yahweh has saved, taking a people for himself out of another nation. Through the Bible, he constantly rescues people for himself. And we see that kind of thing tracked through when we come to Jesus. The last quote for you. This is just after Jesus has fed over 5,000 people. Now, about eight days after these sayings, he, Jesus, took with himself Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which means Exodus in Greek, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with them. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good we're here. Let us make three tents. One for you, one for Moses. I would say the, the God of the Quran is very much consistent with the God of Moses, the God of Jesus, even though the biblical text is, um, is altered. It is, you know, not from the actual prophets themselves, even though what we do find are snippets or glimpses of the truth or glimpses of the teachings of Moses and Jesus even then I believe the God of the Quran is very consistent with the God of the Bible if we minus if we take out the doctrine of the Trinity which was a purely Christian conception um, of God Almighty or God of the Bible thank you very much Another five minutes. Wonderful. Thank you, Anna, very much. Um, where to start? Um, I think it is wonderful that the Bible contains over 40 different human authors who have been inspired by God to write down truth from God. We have all the prophets in our book, not just one. And so we can see whether this message is in keeping with one another and how Jesus might fulfill that as he says he does. I don't think people would dispute, actually, at a scholarly level, that Moses uh, wrote the Hebrew that, that we have. And as you know, all of these uh, books are pre-Muhammad, pre-Quran, and the Quran seems to accept them in some way. And I think we need to be careful that we can never have certainty about anything. We can never be 100% certain about anything, but don't we have a reasonable surety about something. That's how courts work, that's how historians work. They look at evidence, can we know? And I think we can know an awful lot from the uh, evidence of the many prophets that are recorded uh, in these scriptures. Personally, I think it's quite a problem uh, that the God of the Quran only seems to speak in Arabic. It is wonderful that the God of the Bible speaks in a language that people can understand, because that is a, the God who wants people to understand him. It has always been a translated word for us. So did Jesus speak Greek? I think he probably did, because of the region that he lived in. And he spoke Aramaic. I suspect he spoke Latin as well, probably some Hebrew. But why is the New Testament written in Greek? Because God wanted his message to go out across that part of the world. Greek was like the English today, and probably like the Chinese will be in a hundred years' time. It was everybody's second language. God wanted people to hear about himself, because he's a personal, relational God that wants people to know him. Uh, Gabriel being spirits, you know, Jewish people wouldn't accept that at all. Uh, the spirit uh, is an active part of God throughout the, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, along with um, the word. The doctrine of the Trinity was not made up uh, by the church. It's rooted uh, in the witness of the Bible. Why is it that Jesus is accused of blasphemy when he calls himself the son of the father? It's rooted in those texts there. Absolutely, Adnan. Uh, Allah, uh, Elohim, very similar uh, etymologically. Uh, why is it that Christians in the Middle East or in Bangladesh are happy to call God the high God creator Allah? They, they will do that. 
But they would also recognise that that Abba, that Elohim, is further distinguished, and you can know him as Father, Son, and, and Spirit. And it's clear that Jesus calls God Elohim, but also Abba, meaning Father and closeness. I don't think there is uh, evidence for the text uh, being uh, altered. You say that a lot, there's no evidence for something. Um, there is no evidence if you want to kick out all the evidence. I think the evidence is there and we, we can look at that. Um, but I would just love to, to ask you, Adnan, whether you think that you can know God personally, yourself. Uh, does he reveal himself to people? Um, is he relational in that way? Um, what does it mean to uh, love God? Obviously, the great kind of uh, high point just after that, um, those few verses that I said about Moses, uh, when God says he's the unique revealer and rescuer, just shortly after that, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, or Yahweh, your God is one, meaning he's unique, he's one of a kind. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, your God is one, love him with all of your heart, soul, and strength. That who God is, is to provoke a response in us, a, a love response, because of his great love for us. That's a question for, for Adonai. So what, what does love for God look like um, in your experience, and um, what do you teach? And how does, the, how does the Quran play a part in that? Um, is that how you get to know God in some way, him personally? Um, um, and just a, a, another question. So the confession of faith for Muslim people um, isn't the, the Shema of Deuteronomy, here of Israel, the Lord of God is one. Um, it is, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet in English. Why do you put the prophet with God? That seems to be adding something to God. The Shema, the, the quote in Deuteronomy, is God alone. God is unique. You don't need anything added. It feels like, as an outsider, you're adding a person to God. And I, I can't find one verse in the Quran that gives that as the Shahada, the profession. Clearly, the Quran says God is the one God, but it doesn't seem to say more than that. So, Lots of questions for you, Adnan. I'm really happy to talk about texts, but let's talk about God. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, five minutes for me now. Um, language of Jesus. Uh, Rob claimed that he, Jesus would have spoken uh, in, um, Greek. There's no evidence for that. Uh, I would be very willing to accept the evidence if you presented it. Uh, then you said, uh, why would God speak in Arabic? And he spoke in the Greek language and in the Hebrew language so that people can understand God. But equally, if people can understand the Arabic language, if they can understand Greek, they can translate from Greek and Hebrew. I'm sure people can translate from the Arabic language too. So Arabic language didn't come from the moon. <laughs> it is a human language. Uh, then spirit, you said uh, Jewish people don't know the spirit uh, as Gabriel or Gabriel as spirit. No. In the book of Daniel, we have references that it was angel Gabriel who came to the prophets to bring revelation. So we have references to that. So he is also known as the spirit. Uh, so um, evidence for the alteration of the Bible, there is a book I would recommend written by a Christian scholar himself, scholar of the highest repute. Uh, Bruce Metzger has authored a book titled The Text of the New Testament, uh, its uh, transmission, corruption, and restoration. So in the title of the book, the word corruption is there, that the text of the, the New Testament was corrupted and it is now in the process of being restored. So you can look into the book, I read it, and he actually means it when he says the text was corrupted, he meant it, that the, the manuscripts of the Bible were corrupted and we to this day don't know what was actually written by the authors of four gospels and beyond. We have no idea what they actually originally wrote. We don't know the original text. Even though, even if it was in the Greek language, we don't have it. That's another question we can address. Then having relationship with God, absolutely. We all have a relationship with God. We pray um, and we have spiritual experiences, uh, which may be personal. We, uh, we, when we pray five times a day, we are dedicated to God. That's our relationship. We speak with God. We pray to him. He responds to our prayers through dreams, through things that happen in our life. And we get cured, uh, cured by God. There are so many things I can talk about uh, that God is actually present in our lives. 
We all speak to God every single day. Muslims, when they pray five times a day, they pray with firm conviction that that God, the God they're worshiping is listening to them and responding to them. So we have a very strong relationship with God. Okay. Love for God, of course, it comes from one's dedication, one's, uh, one's uh, attention towards God. It, it may vary from person to person. The more dedicated you are, the more you will fall in love with God and you will see His wonders. Um, so, confession of faith, when you mention uh, the Shema, uh, I would like to mention that Shema is exactly la ilaha illallah. There is no one worthy of worship except God and Jesus, Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse 29, um, when a Jewish man asked him, what is the first commandment? And he said, here is the Lord, our God is one Lord. That's the Shahada, right? And Jesus himself said, I'm, I sent, uh, I've been sent by God. And that's the second part of the Shahada, that uh, when you Christians claim that there is no way to God except through Jesus, okay? You cannot come to God except, that's the second part of the Shahada. So the first part is you worship one God alone, and the second part is that Jesus is the way to God at his time for his people, right? Then when Moses was alive, he was the way to God. When Abraham was preaching to his people, he was the way to God. When Muhammad came, he was the way to God. So that's why we say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, Isa Rasulullah, Musa Rasulullah, Ibrahim Rasulullah. We consider, we accept all of those prophets. With regards to the doctrine of the Trinity, that's a very big question. I've had extensive debates with Christian friends on that. That is a development or an extension of the God of the Bible or extension to the God of the Bible, which cannot be found in the Bible. And I say this with absolute confidence and honesty and integrity that the doctrine of the Trinity or the Trinitarian conception of God cannot be found in the Bible. It is superimposed it is actually read into the text of the Bible, not the other way around. Thank you so much. That's five minutes over. Thank you both very much also for the, the time. It perfectly makes my life very easy. And we're opening this up for questions now. You can either ask them online. And in, if we do that, I hope that we could see them somewhere. Or no, I see them all. Yeah, have, have I have it here. Okay. While I try to figure out the technology, you can also ask a question in person in the room, in which case. And, uh, oh, there's a microphone over there. So, so if I request uh, maybe one question for Rob and one question for myself um, uh, to keep yeah. things balanced, yeah. and maybe uh, if we give one minute to answer and 30 seconds to uh, give a response to the answer, and vice versa. Good, so, okay, we, yeah, we can yeah, try that. Yeah. Yeah. We stick to our, we'll try to stick to our okay. time, which is a little experiment. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Uh, so we have yeah. you in the front. Where's, could you pass the microphone? I can you summarize? For everyone that came late, <laughs> okay. impression. What do I say now? Um, uh, I, thi I, I, I think I have to let these people speak. For summarize for what? Sorry. The whole debate? For latecomers. For latecomers, for latecomers uh, we can only summarize in the Q&A. I think it would be unfair for everyone else to, uh, to for us to go through the same exercise again. Uh, so I think jump into the water and swim, I would say. <laughs> yes. That's also been recorded. Yes, yes. Um, uh, forgive me, what is your name? Uh, My name? Yes. My name is Adnan. What? Adnan. Adnan. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, my question is uh, more contemporary in terms of its, its uh, where it comes from. Uh, particularly scholars like Dr. Dan, uh, Dan Gibson, um, Dr. Jay Smith, and a few other more recent scholars have come uh, and begun to uh, apply a lot of the same literary techniques and a lot of the same um, criticisms to the origin of the Quran, um, particularly around uh, the uh, origin of the language and the verbiage and its construction. Um, from uh, You talk a lot uh, in your your, your, your speech um, about the Bible and the construction of the Bible. 
but you spoke very little about the construction of the Quran. I was just hoping that you could speak on that and whether or not the more recent scholarship that has come out, um, how you interpret that. And, and, and for those who don't know, there's some uh, scholars who have taken a look at some of the earliest manuscripts and seen that they have uh, corrections and adjustments to them. Uh, I'm just curious what your response is to that. Thank you very much. You mentioned a couple of people. I don't consider them to be scholars. <laughs> just do excuse me for that. Uh, because they're not peer reviewed, they're not published in any uh, reputable uh, academic journal or, uh, or institution, so they're not scholars. Uh, uh, scholars are people like uh, Tarosh, you can look at his book, uh, the, the, the Umayyad Qurans, for example, uh, you have Nikolai Sinai, and these are not Muslims I'm mentioning, non Muslim scholars in particular. There is a man called Van Putin, Marine Van Putin, is very active on Twitter, and he's a uh, is uh, at Leiden University. So if you look at their works and how they see the Quran uh, from a non-Muslim perspective, you will you will see a lot of um, um, a lot of st a lot of study of these manuscripts you mentioned. So none of them actually amazingly use the word corruption for the Quran. Actually, all of them, what I have seen so far, are unanimous that the, the text of the Quran was well established and canonized very early on within the lives of the companions of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, if not the life of the Prophet himself, right? So there is no such discussion on the Quran. That's why I didn't indulge in that. But when it comes to the, the text of the New Testament, it's a completely different story uh, because both documents were written in different circumstances and different times for different people. Uh, the history of the Quran is very different to the history of the Bible, completely different. So to be fair, they have to be treated differently. Okay, you want to respond? Well, 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Sit your um, Yeah, I, I don't think that, that is true. I think Adnan is um, very careful of getting rid of evidence I wanted to deal with. Um, I don't think the earliest Qurans do agree. I think there are differences between them. I think they have the same kind of issue with manuscripts um, as any ancient uh, text. Uh, in many ways, so the earliest two aren't, aren't complete for copy on some account, uh, and they disagree with one another. Um, that doesn't necessarily matter, you could work it out, except even within the orthodox history of Islam, uh, the Caliph Uthman, he destroyed the different copies, didn't he? So you don't know what the original was back in the day. So I think there are, there are real debates to be had. Um, other people to, to read, it would be someone like Angelica Nerwa, uh, another German scholar, who looks at the social milieu in which they think the Quran was constructed, maybe in Northern Arabia rather than in Mecca, maybe later, maybe the Abdul al-Malik. Um, lots of things that can be discussed. But I think the important thing for us both to discuss, and for all to discuss, is who is the God that we're wanting to follow and worship, and is he trustworthy, and can we know him? Thank you. Thank you very much. So here I have the top-rated question. Whoops, I've just deleted my own. There it is. Why do Christians not accept Muhammad as a prophet if the Bible says a prophet will come after Jesus? I guess that goes to the Lord right. first. Yes. Great question. Um, partly because of what Jesus said himself says. He says he's come to fulfill the law and the prophets. He says the law and the prophets of the Psalms are fulfilled in his life and his death and his resurrection. So we don't need to look for anybody else, be it someone in the 6th century, someone in the 18th, be it Joseph Smith in New York with his or Utah with his golden plates, be it whoever comes later, Jesus fulfills everything that has been promised in the previous prophets, which is why it's great we've got all the prophets in here so we can check it out. That's the beauty of having all of them there. I don't think Muhammad is prophesied at all uh, within uh, the Hebrew scriptures or the Greek scriptures. I'm sure Adnan will disagree, but I think we, if we want to look at all of those texts, we can do, but I don't think he's prophesied in any way. Thank you, Rob. I, I will simply ask everyone to watch one of my debates with an Australian scholar, Christian scholar. Uh, his name is uh, Samuel Green, and the title of the debate is Is Muhammad Foretold in the Bible? Watch the debate and make your own minds up. I use uh, biblical references uh, extensively. Coming to the differences in the Quran copies, please present them. If you have the evidence, please do present the differences. So let, let us see. I want these differences to come out so that I can actually know about them as well. I've been looking for the last 20 years. We haven't found any differences in verses, in words. Uh, yeah, readings, if you're talking about um, variations in how to pronounce the words, how 
the reading style to work on the Quran, absolutely there are differences, no doubt. But if you will claim differences in the manuscripts of the Quran, you will have to present the evidence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I suggest we read out one more question from here and then it goes back to the audience in the room. So, can you conclusively and coherently explain why attributing Jesus as a son and equal to God is not polytheism? Is that a question to me or Rob? <laughs> I don't know. I don't mind if Rob goes first, no problem. Go ahead. The understanding of God as he reveals himself uh, in the scriptures uh, from Moses onwards is that he's a creator, he's a sustainer, he's a revealer, he's a rescuer. That's what it means for the God of the Old Testament to be one, unique, one of a kind. People sadly seeing there's only one arsenal, which sadly is true at the moment. They are unique, they are winning, there's only one of them. So in that sense, they, that's what it means for the Lord God to be one, unique. He's unique as creator, sustainer, revealer, and rescuer. That's all the way through. He's incomparable in that kind of way. As that is revealed in Scripture, though, it's clear that there is a spirit that is active and a word that is active, even through the Hebrew Scriptures too. As we come into the Greek Scriptures, we see that that word takes flesh, that that word is creative, that word sustains, that word is... Jesus, as he stills a storm with the same words in which the God of Genesis 1 creates. He says, let it be still, and it is, just like there is let it be light uh, in the beginning. He calls himself the son to show that he's not a threat to his father. He is of the same stuff, although I don't think God's stuff exists. He is the son following his father's will. So he's not a threat to his father in any way. He does the same things that his father does all the way through. So for example, in John's Gospel, he does that. And the Jewish people who are listening to him think he is blaspheming. So they are hearing him making divine claims about himself. But he shows he's not a threat to God in any way. He follows his uh, uh, father's will in order to rescue and reveal to people. That's not polytheism because polytheism is defined as adding extra to God. It's a God who is not the creator, who is not the sustainer, who is not the revealer, who is not the rescuer. And the son, as he walks in Palestine, shows himself to be those things which seem keeping with the whole understanding of God in the Old Testament. Thank you. Uh, it is absolutely polytheism. <laughs> uh, I believe if you put Jesus Christ on par with the Father, whom he worshipped, so if Father was equal to God Almighty, or God the Father, let's say, as the doctrine of the Trinity stipulates, then that would mean Jesus doesn't have to worship his equal, but he's worshiping the Father. If you read the text of the New Testament, he's consistently worshiping the Father. He calls him Abba, the Father, the creating Father, right? So if Father is equal to Jesus Christ as a person within the Trinity, then there is no point of worshiping someone who's equal to you, right? It doesn't make sense. So the doctrine of the Trinity by necessity constitutes polytheism, what we call shirk in the Arabic language. Because if all three persons are part of one being, then these three persons are not each other. The Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son. And if that's the case, then each person has an independent mind, an independent will. If that's the case, that's a separate personality. And that's a separate God with separate thinking, separate mind, separate independence. And if that's the case, then that's three gods put together in allegedly one being, which is impossible. That's, that's a paradox which Christian scholars have been uh, debating for centuries, last 2,000 years, and hence they have declared it a mystery. A mystery. You want 30 seconds if you want, or otherwise you'll end up right. That was my response for 30 seconds. We could have a response for a response if you go all night. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, we're going to be here uh, <laughs> debating the Trinity. Maybe sure, maybe we should. There's a question over there. Hi. Um, I just want to make a quick comment just on like at the meta level, looking at the debate. Um, and then my question, my real question is basically, so how do you think Christians and Muslims can make sure we act when we die now? Because obviously, like, let's, let's take the fact, right, there were the Crusades, there were a thousand four hundred years of life. I mean, it's great that we're here not killing each other. It's amazing. We've made a, we've come a long way. Um, how do you think, like, Christians and Muslims can have better dialogue about faith with each other? Um, it would be good to hear both your views. 
Because I think it's like quite often what ends up happening is just speaking past each other. And I think this is sort of happening as well. It's sort of like the Christian has a certain way of doing theology, which the Muslim has a different way of. And I think, yeah, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because it seems to me that uh, from uh, what you're saying is sort of within the Islamic faith, so the Quran is the literal word of God in that sense, and it's it is sort of like at the core of the of of sort of Islamic belief, right? And then and, you know you accept further from that and it's really important that every word of it is from God and it forms the theology. Um, and whereas I guess for a Christian perspective, like some Christians, maybe Rob would not agree with this, but lots of Christians would agree with you and say, and which is why you have Christians who agree that yeah, the Bible is, it might be corrupted because for them, their view of their doctrine of revelation is that the revelation of God is Jesus Christ, not the Bible as we have it. And, Yes, we do all this scholarly work because we want to find out who the real Jesus is. And you can still kind of, even based on kind of a critical scholarship, which applies a sort of like an atheistic view to look at the Bible, you can still kind of come up with, so some things you can say about Jesus which are still quite significant. And which is why I guess there are some Christians, like you say, who, who publish books, say that the Bible is corrupted, but it doesn't really disturb them because for them, Revelation is not about the Bible, but it is about Jesus Christ. So it's just like an example of when people speak past each other, it seems. I just want to know how you guys think, like at a practical level, how Christians and Muslims can have better dialogue that don't speak to each other. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think it's a comment for both of us when you comment on this. I, I think the, the dialogue between Christians and Muslims has, has never been so good, historically speaking. I think we're living in a, a golden age in that regard, where Christians and Muslims have been debating for the last, let's say, 50, 60 years actively and the debates have been very civil. They haven't caused any riots. There hasn't been a crusade launched or jihad launched because of those debates, right? So these debates are very healthy. They should continue so that we can come close to each other. The purpose of these debates is not to spread hate or dislike each other, rather it's to appreciate each other more. I actually appreciate Christian devotion towards God. I actually do appreciate it. I admire it, right? I don't agree with it. I believe it's misguided, but I admire it. Okay, and that dedication, if directed, directed correctly, can lead to great results. Uh, and I'm pretty sure many Christians see uh, devotion in Muslims similarly, right? So I think this dialogue is amazing. Even though if we seem to be talking past each other, let it continue. Let people watch, let them listen, and let them decide. Because there are people who are listening, we may be talking past each other, but there are people who are listening to both of us and they might go and research these questions and find different results. So dialogue is always uh, um, uh, encouraged, encouraged and I think it should continue. Yeah, absolutely. I think, so beginning with Minister Gold, he was very clear, that's partly why he wants to say we believe the same God, is so we don't disagree and, and hurt each other, because that's what he saw in former Yugoslavia. But I think hopefully we can disagree um, one shape friend, he says, these aren't meetings for better understanding, they're, they're meetings for better quality disagreements. And we hope that we can understand one another better, live in the same community, listen to each other. Um, I think the way to do that is to talk, to open up texts with one another. That's what I found really useful with my footballing friends in Tower Hamlets, to compare and contrast stories the prophets, to tease out differences, which are really important, even as we accept uh, crucial similarities uh, as, as well. I think opening up texts with one another, having the confidence to do that, and the confidence to ask difficult questions, but in a polite way, not seeking to offend or wind up. We both think we're right. Clearly we both can't be right, but we can still have, you would hope, a reasonable discussion about these kinds of things and our foundations and what it means for us to know God and whether we can. And we'd hope that you guys could do that too. You can just open up texts, talk to one another. What does this mean? How can I have confidence in this? What does it mean for my life? And it's, it is interesting that I want everybody to read the Bible. I think it is God's word to us. It shows us who he is, what he has done, how we can come to know him. I very rarely found Muslim people wanting to open up the Quran with me. And I think that's very sad. I, I wonder if that's something about their faith or something about the Quran that makes them not want to do it. But I think it's a great thing to do. Um, let's take another question from from the audience here. Where is our... Okay. Hi, 
thank you very much for, um, for coming and speaking with us today. I really appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to um, ask you, Adnan, about um, your view of the um, Trinitarian concept um, of Christianity. And um, my, my belief is, and I hope my Christian friends will sort of share the same belief as well, is that the, um, the idea of the concept of the Trinity goes hand in hand with the um, belief that Jesus was fully God, fully human as well, that he was the incarnate, God incarnate. Um, and, you know, when Jesus is born, you know, they, the, the prophets say that um, he is um, he is Emmanuel, um, sort of God, God with us. And I think that that, that, that idea of maybe um, can, can go hand in hand with the idea of the Trinity as, as well. And in terms of um, the, the Trinity being like a divine divine mystery as well, it's like something, if God is omniscient and all, all powerful and all knowing, then um, maybe for our human brains, it's very complicated to understand the, um, machinations of, of the Trinity and the, how, how it works on a, on a meta concept and um, yeah, I just wanted to know your, your thoughts on that. Again, I've had a debate uh, in Australia on this very important topic, is Jesus God? Uh, do watch that debate, it's online with Samuel Green. Uh, I present all my evidence from the Bible and uh, the Quran uh, as to why I believe Jesus could not possibly be God because of the evidence I present. I believe this notion of Jesus being God came from pagan Rome. It didn't came from. It didn't come from the Jewish people. Uh, Jesus was speaking to the Jewish people. He was a Jewish prophet uh, or Israelite, to use a more uh, historically correct term. He was an Israelite prophet. He was not uh, a prophet to the Gentiles, which is very clearly stated in, in the text of the Bible. Okay. Uh, and if that's the case, then the Jewish people did not give you God-man. God-man came from the Romans, okay? Or people who were directly inspired by the Greek philosophy, the Hellenics, uh, the, you know, Hellenic philosophy, I don't know if you know much about it. Uh, uh, many of the church fathers who postulated the doctrine of the Trinity were actually Greek philosophers. Many of them, I can name them. You'll be shocked to know that the doctrine of the Trinity was entirely their product, not Jewish theologians or Jewish or Israelite sages or even Jewish Christians. Christians who actually were uh, were Jewish uh, originally, they were following the Mosaic law and they believed in Jesus Christ as a prophet. They didn't believe him, uh, believe in him as a God, right? So this notion of the divinity of Jesus Christ could not possibly come from the Israelites. It came from pagan Rome. And this is a very huge topic. It's a vast topic. And I, I, I advise you to read Bart Ehrman's uh, book, When Jesus Became God. Uh, that gives you uh, a lot of uh, insights into this topic. So this is not as simple as reading the text of the Bible and reading the divinity into the text because there are verses therein that, uh, that argue the exact opposite, that he could not possibly be God. If you're saying, Father is greater than I, I can of my own self do nothing, okay? Um, I, he doesn't know the hour, okay? This is not God, okay? Who is hungry, who is being nailed to the cross and he's crying my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is not God. This is a human being who is going through human difficulties. Okay, But then again, it's a very complicated uh, topic that requires a lot of detail, which we cannot give in this uh, short setting. The first believers, the first followers of Jesus were Jewish people who were following him as the son. Uh, I don't think there's any dispute about that. The uh, previous scriptures talk about uh, a messianic figure, uh, as someone in the mind of David, who would also lead his people as God led his people in, in Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel, 500 years before Jesus, and the prophet Isaiah, who talks about someone being born again in David's line, again as Messiah, who will be mighty God. So there's prophecies again in all the prophets that we have in the book, not just one, but all of them, to show the continuity, to show the fulfillment, to show who Jesus is and what he came to do. So the whole uh, 
doctrine of following one God who's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was believed by the first believers and had taught throughout the scriptures. And it's interesting just that the title Messiah already blows categories as to who Jesus is. He's not simply a prophet. The Messiah means anointed one. The same kind of Greek word Christ, they all mean the same anointed one. And Jesus is an anointed one as a prophet speaking God's words. He is an anointed one as a king ruling for God's people. He's an anointed one as a priest bringing people into God's presence. Those are the three types of anointed ones in the previous scripture. So already he's more than a prophet. And he's called Son of God. He's called Son of God in different ways. Uh, the kings were called Son of God, and he's like that. Adam was called a Son of God to represent, and he's like that. Israel is called a Son of God, and he's like that in close relationship with God. But he's more than that. He's the divine Son, walking on earth, doing God-like things, like stilling a storm, like feeding 5,000 people out of a boy's lunchbox, like dying and rising again. Thank you, and here's the next question, the, the third most popular question, which is, what is the evidence for the Quran being written in a single language? How is the origin point linguistically so certain? The, the evidence is overwhelming, and we have, uh, if not thousands, hundreds of manuscripts of the Quran from the very lives of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, and we can complete the Quran entirely from within the first century when uh, many of his companions are alive. Why do I say companions? These are the people who took the Quran directly from the Prophet and penned it down on parchment, on vellum, on in copies. And those copies still remain to this day. We have them distributed in uh, international libraries. Uh, some of them you can find in Britain. One of them is actually uh, the Birmingham parchment that has been carbon dated to have come from the life of the Prophet himself. The animal was killed within the life of the Prophet. Uh, the animal, you know, because vellum is skin and carbon dating shows you when the animal was killed. So the text could be later or it could be at the same time. But my theory on that particular parchment is that it is Uthmanic. It is not from the life of the Prophet. It is actually later because the, the, the rendition or the recension, uh, the text that's found in that parchment is Uthmanic recension. So uh, we have overwhelming evidence, no serious scholar, no peer-reviewed serious scholar in the world has ever challenged the veracity or the early canonization of the Quran. And those who did, they themselves uh, basically uh, uh, went back on the theory and they followed uh, the majority, and the majority is very clear on this. And I'm talking about non-Muslim uh, scholars who have no agenda to promote the Quran and the Word of God. I think the, the, the Birmingham manuscript is interesting in itself. As Adam said, there's, it's got a range of dates, as all radio carbon does, and one of the, the earliest dates is before uh, Muhammad's birth. So it could predate Muhammad, which is interesting. So were there things around before Muhammad uh, spoke? There is no complete Quran from the first century. No complete. We haven't got one complete text from the seventh century. And that's, I find that really interesting because the technology is available to preserve whole books. You've got a whole Bible from the 4th century. Why haven't you got a whole Quran from the 7th century? It's an interesting question, I think, that needs answering. Um, and just to pick up something on the Arabic, um, I, I'm sorry I wasn't clear. I'm not saying God can't speak Arabic um, at all. Clearly, I think he can speak every language. I think my issue with the Quran being in Arabic is it suggests that God only speaks Arabic and that he's untranslatable. Whereas I think God is always translatable, always knowable, always relational, and that's why I have a book that is translatable. Can I quickly comment on this very quickly? Sure. Uh, you said there is the whole Bible from the fourth century. Which one is that? It's not complete. What's missing? It's missing the, the, the verses of the Gospel of Mark. Okay. And it's, it's uh, from 9 to 20. The last Verses oh, of the Gospel of Mark. 16, right? Yeah, it is that's missing. That's fine. No, it is missing for Rock of Adultery. That, that's, that's no problem at all. Because but then it's missing, right? But they're not, they're not part of the manuscript. It's quite clear yeah, that those so are not in the originals. And, and, and it, it doesn't have uh, the, the, the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not complete in it. But it's, it is the, the, it, you, you can say, you can claim that it is the earliest but why don't we have testimony Arabic, to the New Testament. Why don't we have a whole Arabic Quran from the 7th century when the technology good, is available? Good question. 
um, do we have a complete Quran from the first century in one copy from, for, let's say, from uh, within 100 years of the Prophet of Islam's death? Absolutely not. We don't have one copy. But what we do have, we have chunky volumes. Okay? For example, I can give you example names. Do you, do you want me to name some of the manuscripts? One third of the Quran is with the British Museum. It is called uh, the Hijaji Quran. It's, it is in mild script. It is from the first century, right? One third is there. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to be slightly impolite here now. <laughs> when our Christian missionary friends use these tactics to deceive the Muslims, that you don't have the complete Quran from the first century. This is a, this is this is very incorrect. We do have the complete Quran from the first 100 years because we have so many copies, so many copies that we, we can easily complete the entire Quran in one text, right? And they're so consistent with each other that there are no differences. But that cannot be said for the, for the New Testament. And actually the complete, the most complete Bible in history, you'll be shocked to hear this, uh, is from the 16th century where the complete text of the Old Testament and the New Testament can be found in one manuscript. 16th century. Pin drop silence. Take me up on this. During the Q&A or after the Q&A. Take Can me up on this. Seconds? Please, please. I think that's the greatest reading in history. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have two more questions here which are both quite popular but problematic. So the first is irrelevant to the talk but can we hear some Seleti from Robert at the end? <laughs> which I leave to you. But we're approaching the end, so if, if, if you want, the moment is now. And the next question, that's a difficult one. How, you, how can you believe in something you don't have complete certainty about? Good luck with those questions. Is that for me? I don't know. You uh, how can we believe in something? Uh, I have absolute certainty that Islam is true. The Quran is from God. God exists. I have no doubt absolutely no doubt that there is a creator we call Allah and he has to be one he alone deserves to be worshipped he sent prophets and one of them is prophet Muhammad I have absolutely no doubt in fact I am so certain that I can put my life on it okay right so I am absolutely certain that prophet Muhammad was a true prophet of God and the Quran is revealed by God. So I have no doubt. This conversation, because it's technical, we have to sometimes get into technical details. Technical details doesn't mean doubt or lack of certainty. It means that we are actually justifying our certainty. We're showing you the reasons why we are certain, right? So this doesn't mean lack of certainty, it, not at least on my part. No, I don't know about Rob. Rob can speak for itself. I, I am like and unlike and uh, utterly convinced uh, that the God of the Bible is true, that he's Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Philosophically, logically, um, and all the other kind of academic type words, we cannot have 100% certainty about anything, but it's how we deal with those doubts, and how we work through them, and what level of certainty we can that is reasonable. So I cannot be certain that this chair is going to hold me up for the next 10 seconds. I can't be absolutely certain. Something might break if I rock on it. But I still sit on it, and I put my faith, my trust in it. Similarly, I am, and put my faith in this book, because it fulfills itself. It shows me a God that makes sense of me as a relational being, because God is relational, so I can relate to him. Joseph Celeste? Yes. Joyful. Joseph Celeste, Ami Celeste, Celeste Hur, Kesman, Ami Mar Fori Barbaya, Kesman. Uh, I went to Salat 10 years ago with my family to learn Salat. Did anyone understand? <laughs> so I could have said anything. Many exactly. I could have said anything. Last page. Oh, good, huh? Wow. wow. Amazing. I'm impressed. <laughs> I think it went from uh, profound to then very difficult, like certainty to incomprehensible at the very end. <laughs> <laughs> the moment we should stop, I'd like to 
thank our two speakers very much for their willingness to, to come here and speak with us. And to, to <laughs> with uh, I'd like to thank you for showing up online and in person, and have a good evening, everyone.